Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hello everyone and welcome to Work in Progress, the personal productivity science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I am your host, Joanna. Let's get started. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Joanna. And today on Work in Progress, we've got a topic I always love talking about, which is food, but more specifically, brain boosting foods that help nourish our minds for maximum productivity. And that's going to be our focus for today. So joining me today is Tara Torres. And Tara is the owner of Sky Therapeutics, and their mission is to enhance their clients' health by optimizing lab results and offering tools like meal plans, food tracking apps, and more to help people stay on top of that. And further, Tara is also a functional nutritionist specializing in weight loss, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and other obesity-linked conditions. And on top of that, she's also a researcher, educator, podcast host and consultant. So with extensive experience, Tara aids clients in enhancing their health through tailored nutrition and lifestyle guidance. I could really go on, but I'll hand it over to Tara now. Hey, Tara, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. It's my pleasure to have you here today. Um, Before we get started with everything, I'd love to find out how you got into the position you are now and what inspired you to go down this path. Yeah, so many years ago, it seems, I was diagnosed with celiac disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which are both autoimmune conditions. And that really prompted me to take a deeper look at my gut health and my nutrition, my overall health. And so I started just kind of learning things on my own with nutrition, but then I just became so interested and I just kind of fell in love with nutrition and understanding what we can do through our own lifestyle in order to influence certain diseases and conditions and health that I decided to go to school for it. So I got my undergrad in um, a bachelor's of science in nutrition science, and then I have a master's of science in human nutrition and functional medicine, and I'm now a doctoral student in clinical nutrition. Um, And I just, I'm just so passionate about it. And it just stems from a personal history that has been fed from just numerous client and patient testimonies and helping them feel better. Wow, that is a lot going on for you, but that sounds amazing. Um, I'd love to ask how you found Sky Therapeutics and where that all began. Okay, so I was working, I I worked for a couple different physician offices as their nutritionist leading wellness departments as the director of wellness at one point and just juggling everything that life throws at you between trying to maintain somewhat of a social life on top of school, being a mom. I got so burnt out and I started to have to deal with like, you know, I talked about how I started with celiac and Hashimoto's. Well, I fixed that. And then fast forward a decade or so. Now we're older and we're starting to understand the repercussions of stress on our hormones and our weight. So it just became, again, a personal thing where I decided, you know, I was prepared to wait tables at that point. I just needed out of that position. And when I left, I was fortunate that people still sought me out for help. And so I said, well, I guess I'm going to do this thing. And we started a business and that's how Sky Therapeutics came about. Beautiful. And how long has it been going on for now? Sorry. So this spring will be three years officially. How have you found the journey from like the beginning to now? Have you seen like any like changes throughout it? Yes, I think 
you learn so much being an entrepreneur and working for yourself. And I'm so grateful that I have that foundational experience of working in different clinics and being able to take that and translate it into my own business. But I don't think anything ever prepares you for the ups and downs and the ebb and flow that is working for yourself, I think, in any field. Um, But I think we get better every time, you know, with each client experience, you learn something new or you fine tune and finesse something. And that's probably what I love the most about it. And I'm just so excited to see where we're at in a couple of years. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, we've got this section that we've called, Have You Met Tara? So we just get to know you a bit more with some fun little questions. Um, and my first one for you is, I know you're a bit of an animal lover. Can you tell me about your foster dogs? <laughs> yes. Um, my kids and I have a really bad habit of picking up strays and <laughs> so much so. And and thankfully, we've been able to reunite a few with their family members. We were able to adopt out a couple, um, help pe- some of them medically. And so we decided to finally align ourselves this year with a formal organization because when you do it on your own, you don't have the financial backing And sometimes those medical expenses can get kind of crazy. So now we're in the fortunate position where we work with the American Belgian Malinois Rescue. And the Belgian Malinois breed is a very uh, special type of breed. They just need a lot of work and discipline. And we're fortunate to be experienced in that breed. And we just enjoy working with them and finding them homes that are suitable. That's so beautiful. Have you had dogs for a long time or was this like a new thing you guys started doing? No, I've had dogs my whole life. So both my parents were in the military. And so we've always worked with working dogs, German Shepherds, Belgian Malinois. And my mom works at the airport with a um, bomb dog and they, you know, search all the crates and stuff to make sure they're safe. And so we've had a Malinois around the house for quite a few years. And now we're fortunate to get to experience new cuties and find them new homes. It's been pretty rewarding. Oh, that's so beautiful. Perfect. Well, my next question for you is, do you have a favorite sport or a hobby that you enjoy doing? So I think my personal hobby has always been just working out the gym. Um, I have always been kind of a gym rat. I love going in and lifting weights, but I just love being outdoors in general. So I grew up in Alaska. So lots of mountains, hiking, snowboarding, um, ice skating, you know, and now with my kids, we try to get out to the parks, we ride bikes, we're running. I love doing like half marathons. I won't ever do a full marathon, but I'll do a half marathon. (laughs) But my kids are big time baseball and softball players. And I wish I had played as a kid because I just love watching them and the skills that they're developing. Yeah, for sure. I feel like sport is such a great thing to grow up on. And especially if you start as a kid, it's something you can really carry on when you're as an adult as well, which I feel like I wish I did more. Yes. Awesome. Well, I've got a couple more questions for you. So my next one is if you could travel to one place in the world, where would that be? Switzerland. Oh, I think um, I'm actually going in a couple of weeks and it wasn't something that was like on my radar, really, I think. Um, But I'm excited to go. I'm excited to experience the new culture. And I think we're going to hop over to France. And I'm just excited. I've never been to Europe. So I'm really excited to do it. Yeah, perfect. Well, I feel like it's a great time for that with everyone going to Europe at the moment. Um, How long are you going for? Just a couple days. Uh, Yeah, I have a friend who's presenting at a conference there and I'm lucky enough to go and support them. Oh, lovely. Well, I hope you have a great time there. Um, My last question for you is, do you have a famous role model or it could just be anyone in your life that you look up to? Yeah. So I don't have a famous role model, but I do think I admire some of the women in my doctoral cohort because many of them are working moms like myself and they have created these thriving nutrition businesses and they have been very successful. They're very busy and they're helping a lot of people and they have a wealth of knowledge. They've been doing this for many more years compared to my experience. And I just truly look up to them because of the things that they juggle within the profession, but also personally within their family lives. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing those with us. Um, I'd love to jump straight into our interview questions now. Um, so my first one for you is, how would you define the concept of brain boosting foods? So brain fo boosting foods are a specific type of food or nutrient that are believed to have a positive impact on our cognitive function, mental clarity, and just overall brain health. And these foods are thought to enhance, you know, various aspects of brain performance, like our memory, concentration, creativity, and problem-solving skills. And so these types of nutrients and foods can potentially optimize our brain function, leading to improvements in those areas. So, um, you know, with a cognitive function, we look at nutrients like antioxidants and vitamins, minerals, anything that's going to support our health and function. Um, and then for like focus and concentration, we might look at like omega-3 fatty acids, which are common in like fatty fish, like salmon. Um, we also look at mood regulation through different B vitamins that can help with like things like anxiety and depression. And we also see increased um, energy and alertness. So a lot of times we're looking at macronutrients for that. So like your protein, your carbs, and your fat, and just making sure you're getting enough of those types of things. And then just overall long-term brain health can be supported as well. Just, you know, healthy aging. Yeah. And how do you think this contributes to improving our productivity? Yeah. So I think the more we can concentrate and focus on the task at hand, the more efficient we're going to be and be able to complete tasks more timely and not get behind yeah, in professional sure. school and personal life, right? <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, I feel just... like that's really important because sometimes we might think about it just as a personal thing and it only affecting like our personal lives. But I feel like that also impacts like our professional lives and what we bring into like the workplace, especially. Yes. Awesome. So I know there's this idea of like diets and then like cheat days and like specific foods that you can let yourself have only like once every, like once in a while. So how can people balance, you know, enjoying their favorite foods, but also maintaining a diet that supports healthy brain function? So I think that depends on the degree of cognitive decline or like what we're dealing with. You know, somebody with a known dementia or Alzheimer's or whatever cognitive decline, anxiety or depression even, we're going to want to instruct a little more uh, restrictedness on that picture because those are the people that need more consistency when it comes to getting in those foods and those supplements and practicing the lifestyle. But in general, I think if you're trying to be preventative and just kind of manage day-to-day -day stress, it's not affecting you and like your adrenal health and other things. Then I think we can, it's totally fine to do like the 80 20 rule, where 80% of the time you're consistent with your diet, you're getting in these brain boosting foods, but also you live a little bit and you don't feel like you have to track every little thing. And I think that can be applied to situations like weight loss, but also any condition, but certainly cognitive health as well. Yeah. And can you talk to us a bit more about what cognitive health is and what that kind of looks like? Yeah. So I think it's so in functional medicine, we always talk about how we're trying to optimize health. So in certain conditions, you know, people will come to us and they have a pre-diagnosed conditions like I mentioned that a dementia or maybe they have anxiety, depression, or maybe they just have decreased focus, brain fog, those types of things. So we're just looking for ways to optimize that. And a lot of times we just start with lifestyles. So simply changing somebody's diet from something highly refined and processed and westernized to more fruits and vegetables, more protein, more balanced, more clean. People with that, you know, li I say little change, but it really can be a drastic lifestyle change for many people. But my point is by simply controlling what you put into your mouth, you could potentially avoid the need to take a handful of supplements or worse, medications that may have potential side effects. Yeah, for sure. And just in terms of like supplements, is that something you recommend people take alongside a healthy diet or is it more just based on if you're lacking in something? I think food first. You know, 
There's no sense in putting a bunch of supplements into your body if, for example, you have a gut imbalance. Because then we're going to question, are you even breaking down and absorbing these supplements correctly? You could potentially be wasting your time and your money on a bunch of supplements. So you also want to focus on food first because how effective are the supplements going to be if you're still continuing the pro-inflammatory lifestyle, including diet, high stress, lack of exercise, and lack of sleep? I mean, sleep is so important for cognitive function. Yeah. And considering someone who perhaps has dietary requirements like a vegetarian or like a vegan, how can they ensure that they're, you know, eating the right sort of brain boosting foods, but also knowing which kind of supplements to take to replace the types of foods that they can't eat? That's a great example. I'm glad you brought that up because sometimes we do see deficiencies with vegan and vegetarian diets in particular. And so that's where supplements can be helpful, right? But that's a anti-inflammatory lifestyle, whereas like a Western diet is very pro-inflammatory. So I would say that's actually beneficial to work with, not the beneficial situation in the case of vegan and vegetarian diets, where I would say, yes, let's utilize supplements, whether it's a protein supplement or an amino acid supplement, but there's also things like 5-HTP and melatonin and different vitamins and herbals even that you could focus on. But when it comes to food, again, things like fatty fish, like salmon, um, mackerel, sardines even, those are brain boosting because they're high in omega-3s and they're anti-inflammatory and your brain loves those types of, you know, healthy fats. Um, Other healthy fats would be like nuts and seeds, particularly uh, uh, almonds and flaxseed, walnuts. Those are healthy fats and they're also antioxidants, which is super important for brain health. Um, Leafy greens like spinach and kale are rich in vitamins and minerals. And then berries like blueberries, strawberries, um, all the berries have lots of antioxidants. And then whole grains like your oatmeal, quinoa, those are going to have a lot of fiber and just energy, which is going to give you good calories and good fuel to support brain function. Um, And I also like talking about dark chocolate just because (laughs) people think as a nutritionist, I'll never recommend chocolate, but dark chocolate actually has a lot of antioxidants in it and it can be a mood boost too for a number of reasons. Yeah, for sure. And I'm so glad you brought up all these like different types of foods um, because it leads to my next question of like how might seem like a really simple question, but what is like the connection between eating these specific sort of good choice foods and how that kind of affects our brains and our productivity? So I think it boils down to their mechanism, right? So are they an antioxidant or are they anti-inflammatory? Because inflammation is like the underlying driver of a lot of conditions. So if we can control inflammation by number one, removing anything pro-inflammatory, like I said, some foods are pro-inflammatory and some are anti-inflammatory. So we can get you more balanced in that area. Also control things like stress can be very pro-inflammatory. That's going to reduce it. And then adding in things that are anti-inflammatory, starting with diet and foods that are anti-inflammatory, like that fatty salmon, nuts and seeds and things like that. And then also looking at supplements because you you can supplement with things like omega-3 fish oil, but you can also consider things like vitamin E, which is anti-inflammatory, whereas things that are an antioxidant are targeting things, what we call free radicals. And basically they oxidize things in the brain. We see that a lot with like nerve disorders. Um, and so trying to choose things that are, you know, going to target free radicals like your antioxidants are going to help in that area. Hopefully that makes sense. No, that definitely did. And we've talked about, you know, some diets like being vegetarian or vegan, and that obviously presents some inherent challenges. But what are some other common dietary challenges that people face when they're trying to incorporate brain boosting foods into their daily lives? Yeah. So accessibility and availability would be my top one because Not everybody can afford some of these foods, you know, whether it's organic, grass-fed, grass-finished, or just fruits and vegetables in general. Some people can't even afford that, unfortunately. And then we have to look at like the seasonal variety. You know, some of these things in different regions aren't going to be available. And so you have to take that into consideration. 
Also, people have different taste preferences. And so that's a potential obstacle. If people don't like the taste of bitter foods, they're less inclined to eat a bunch of raw vegetables and salads and things. So we have to work around that and make, teach people how to make it more palatable. Like, how do you prepare that in conjunction with something else to hide the taste of it? Or do you season it or cook it a certain way? Um, and then time and convenience is another obstacle, especially in the fast paced, busy world that we live in nowadays. A lot of people struggle to find time to cook, let alone meal prep and do all of those things. And then, you know, individual dietary restrictions, everybody's so unique. And I think what works well for one person may not be recommended for another person, you know, what are we looking at as far as like the overall health? Like what other conditions are we dealing with that are contributing to this? And can I give you this supplement or is it contraindicated for something else you're dealing with, you know? Um, and then just a general lack of knowledge. I think there's a lot of information out there on the internet and it's like, how do you sort through all of that? So that's where working with a nutrition professional can help you individualize this and sort through that mess. Um, also cultural influences. So uh, cultural influences are going to certainly um, make people have like a preference for a certain type of food, right? So, or maybe they have like traditional diets that don't align with bo uh, brain boosting foods. Um, and then, you know, just limited variety, costs, and just the misinformation. Misinfor yeah, and I know we t you talked about a bit about pra like p preparing stuff um, and like the preparation that goes into, you know, getting those foods together. So how would you recommend someone who doesn't have much time or is really caught up in like that fast paced sort of life to have time to put together, you know, healthy options that, you know, maximize their productivity? So there's this saying that um, fail to plan, plan to fail. And honestly, it just boils down to take the time to sit down and create a menu. It doesn't have to be complicated. I have worked with people where they thrive off of consistency. And so they may meal prep only two or three meals for the entire week, but they just rotate them. And then the next week we change it up, of course. Um, other people prefer a different meal every single night. Personally, we know between softball and baseball practice and all of our obligations, I'm cooking every two to three nights. So um, I think understanding your schedule and just trying to be as preventative as possible is the key. So yeah, sitting down and planning out what you're going to cook for the week, picking your recipes, and then developing a grocery shopping list. Go to the grocery store or order it. Thank goodness we have so many resources this day where you can just either drive by and pick it up or they deliver it right to you. And so that's one way busy people can get around that. You could also enlist the help of a nutrition professional to cut a lot of that work out for you and meal plan for you. Or you could do a meal prep company. There's a lot of different meal prep companies out there. But I also think if you do like to cook, it's important to experiment and find different recipes that you love. And there's also recipes where you can save time in the kitchen, like one pan meals. There's tools like crock pots and things like that that you can set on a timer. So just consider all the different alternatives when it comes to cooking and meal prepping. Yeah, amazing. And what if people um, have a lot of dietary requirements that they're trying to stick to? Like they might have allergies, they might have chosen a certain lifestyle, like they might be vegetarian, for example. How can they find options without feeling really restricted by, you know, some of these obligations that they have? So I think the restrictiveness comes from an area of deprivation. So if somebody's feeling restricted, the first thing I want to know is why. Are you feeling restricted because it's something you were told not to? You know, fortunately, I think in the case of like vegan and vegetarians, it's very much a personal choice. Um, yeah. Because if it wasn't a personal choice, like if their cardiologist was like, hey, I highly encourage you to be vegetarian. And this person was like, dang, I really miss meat. I miss animal protein. Well, I would say, is there a way that we can bridge the gap and say, let's promote a high intake of vegetables and fruits and a vegetarian lifestyle, but can we incorporate something like eggs? 
and or seafood, which is like a very easy to digest protein. Um, when it comes to food aller allergies and food sensitivities, you know, allergies, people tend to be able to wrap their head around because that's like an acute anaphylactic reaction there. You want to stay away from those. But food sensitivities, a lot of times you're looking at like abdominal bloating, change in bowel habits, maybe some acne or a rash. Like it's not life threatening. And so people tend to toe the line with that a lot more and not be as strict as they need to. But what I always tell those people is if you go through a formal elimination diet with a food sensitivity, not an allergy, but a food sensitivity, you can remove that food for a period of time and reintroduce it and potentially reset that immune response. So for those people, I always tell people it's um, a unfortunate necessary restriction, but it's temporary. And we need to look at that light at the end of the tunnel. We can get you back onto something more normal. Yeah. And I love how there's always so many different ways around restrictions or, for example, you don't have much time to get to like the grocery store, you can get it delivered to you or um, there's so many different ways technology can help, um, but also just different resources as well. So I feel like that's a really good mention. So thank you for that. Um, and before I know you talked about dark chocolate and we often think chocolate, that's like a bad thing. We should try and avoid it because it doesn't have any, you know, dietary benefits. But I'd love to talk about if there's other like misconceptions or myths that exist about foods that are good for our brain. Yes. So I was looking some up because I was curious myself before we sat down. So I wrote some down. And so some of them surprised me. So one of the myths was that supplements are as effective as whole foods. And I want to debunk that because whole foods provide a variety of nutrients and antioxidants that work synergistically together. And so my worry with taking supplements is that you're not going to get that synergistic effect if you're not careful about how you're pairing and not pairing things. And then also the bioavailability. You know, nothing is going to be more bioavailable than a food source of these things. And with supplements, you very much have to look at the form of it, um, the dose, and just the combination of things. Um, and so that brings me to my next myth, which is that supplements are better. And honestly, again, I just, I caution people to just be careful because excessive supplementation can lead to nutrient imbalances, which is potentially harmful. So we want to make sure that we focus on getting as much as we can from a balanced diet first and foremost before we work with those. Um, the next one was even more surprising. It said eating more sugar will boost brain function. That's <laughs> absolutely a myth. And um, excessive sugar consumption can lead to cognitive impairment, actually. And it's linked with things like obesity and type 2 diabetes. So definitely detrimental to brain health. So my advice would be to instead go for a more complex carbohydrate, natural sugar form and like fruits and whole grains. Um, the next one was, I think, a common myth. Coffee and energy drinks are the best way to improve mental alertness. So while caffeine can temporarily improve alertness and focus, excessive caffeine consumption can actually give some people the jitters, anxiety, and disrupt our sleep. So it's important to use caffeine in moderation and not rely on it solely for cognitive enhancement. In fact, we want to focus on sleep. Like if you're so tired, that you need to be drinking that much coffee, I want to address that root cause. Why aren't you sleeping better and feeling more rested? Um, the next one was that high protein, low carb diets are ideal for brain health. And actually, this is a myth because our brain needs a steady supply of glucose from things like carbohydrates so it can operate um, optimally. And extremely low-carb diets can lead to energy depletion and may negatively affect our cognitive uh, performance. And then, oh, eating more of a single superfood is the key to brain health. And again, I think when you think about the synergistic effect of things, we want to make sure that we're getting a well-rounded variety of nutrients from our food. I always tell people variety is the spice of life. So make sure you're getting all the different colors and all the different food groups so that you can get everything you need, including fats. 
So the next myth was that all fats are bad for the brain. But if you recall all the things I was telling you earlier about the fatty salmon, because it's high in omega-3 intake and all of your nuts and your seeds, those are actually forms of beneficial fats that our brain loves. So that's a myth. Um, And then the last one was that you can't improve brain health through diet alone. And while I agree that diet is just one aspect of brain health, it does play a significant role. So I would say that's a myth. It's still like the underlying thing that we need to fix first and foremost. Wow, that was super interesting. I was not expecting a lot of them to be like something people actually think, um, which is really interesting. Um, But the one that caught my attention was the one on supplements, because I know we've been talking about this as well. So I noticed that you said that there can be like an imbalance if you're incorrectly taking these supplements. So if someone's decided that, you know, they want to start taking, I don't know, iron, how would they go about safely integrating that into their diet and knowing how much is right for them? So usually when we're recommending an iron supplement, it's because they're symptomatic and or their lab work shows that they're deficient. And many people don't like taking iron because the side effect is that it's so constipating. Like even despite being deficient, your gut just gets so constipated with iron. Now there's different forms of iron. So there are less constipating forms that actually tend to increase iron levels a lot better. Um, You also have to be careful jumping on the iron supplementation because you need to understand, is it a B12 deficiency as well, right? So understanding like the root cause is super important. And that's where I think working with a nutrition professional is really important to make sure that you're supplementing correctly. And, you know, heaven forbid you think that you're fixing your iron with an iron supplement. And A, creating a whole new set of issues through the constipation and promoting poor gut health because that's going to slow down your motility. Things are going to ferment and then we have to fix that. But also if you don't address the B12 or maybe not the B12, but maybe it's a methylation issue, like there's all these different factors that have to do with anemia. And so just blindly taking a supplement could potentially cause other issues and not actually address the underlying root cause. Um, other vitamins are not as detrimental, you know, your B vitamins, if you consume excess amounts of them, you'll urinate them out. Um, some B vitamins can make you a little jittery or make you flush like niacin and excess can cause skin flushing. Um, also vitamin D. I think a lot of people don't really think of vitamin D as being potentially dangerous, But there is such a thing as vitamin D toxicity. So, you know, it's really important to make sure that you're careful about how you're supplementing these things, how long you're supplementing them for, and make sure that you're working in conjunction with a provider who's looking at lab work to make sure you're doing it safely. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, And my next question for you is, what are some of the long-term benefits of consistently incorporating brain-boosting foods into our diet? So I think long-term benefits would be the improvement in cognitive function through the regular consumption of these foods um, because it's going to improve your memory, your attention, your problem solving and critical thinking. And over time, you're going to see the benefits of that through your academic or your work performance and just mental sharpness in your day-to-day life. Um. And so there could be reduced cognitive decline. So a lot of these foods are associated with a lower risk of age-related cognitive decline, things like Alzheimer's or dementia. And that's where like antioxidants are super important in the long term. Um, We see better um, mood stability. So by focusing on brain health and these brain foods that I mentioned, we can just kind of contribute to the overall emotional stability and well-being and then improve brain resilience. Um, Things like stress can really have a detrimental effect. But if we're eating correctly to offset that, that may help and avoiding like environmental factors. Um, Also long-term memory retention. So things like the omega-3 fatty acids can improve memory retention and recall. And then that's something that declines with age as well. So we see long-term benefits there. 
and then a lower risk of chronic diseases. So things like cardiovascular disease are one of the things like omega-3s are not just good for brain health, but they're also good for cardiovascular disease. So in my mind, two, what is it? Uh, two birds, one stone is the saying. So by improving your brain health, you're actually also fixing your cardiovascular health, and that could potentially prevent you from having a stroke, which is actually a brain injury. Um, okay. And then better sleep was my my last one. So, well, better sleep and weight management, like lifestyle things, because sleep is hands down probably the most crucial thing for long-term cognitive function. And then weight management, because obesity is an inflammatory condition. And so we're trying to control that in our brain. Yeah, for sure. And this, I'm as you've been talking, I'm noticing there's so many factors like involved and so many benefits as well from, you know, having the right diet and in, including the right foods in your diet. So if someone's decided that maybe they haven't been eating as well as they could be, what's like the first step you would recommend in moving towards a better, you know, lifestyle choice in terms of food? So I always say get on board with making a plan, planning your meals or hiring somebody to plan your meals, grocery shopping, like I said, like whatever works for you and your lifestyle. But you have to sit down and you have to set aside time every week to plan out what you're going to have. That way you can make sure that you're hitting all those marks and you're getting all of the brain boosting things that we talked about. Um, And this can help you make mindful choices and ensure that you have the necessary ingredients on hand. And then make sure you're prepping ahead of time, which kind of goes hand in hand with that. Um, But on your designated like meal prep day, make sure you're preparing those foods in advance. So wash and chop your vegetables, cook your grains and store them in a fridge so that they're just easier access during the week. Um, And then try quick and easy recipes. So especially if you're on the go so that you don't feel like you're bogged down. Um, Look for recipes that have like minimal time to prepare. Things like smoothies or salads, one pot dishes come to mind. Um, And then make sure you have portable snacks. So in your meal plan, you want to make sure you're accounting for any snacks. You want to make sure you have things that are healthy and beneficial, ready to grab and go. So you're not picking something less healthy. And then also don't underestimate the power of having frozen fruits and vegetables. I think um, a lot of people think that we, you know, have to have fresh. And to me, there's a good, better, best case scenario. I think the best case scenario is, yes, absolutely getting everything fresh. The next best would be incorporating, you know, frozen things, canned things. And I think that beats the alternative, which is skipping or having something not so healthy. Um, Also, don't forget to make time for breakfast, you know, starting your day with a big, healthy breakfast. My kids come to mind. I want to make sure that they can focus in school and that they're not distracted by low blood sugar. Um, So same for adults. And then make sure you're picking whole grains. So things like quinoa, brown rice, even whole wheat pasta over refined grains, because again, we're trying to be anti-inflammatory here. Um... And then also don't be afraid to substitute ingredients. My favorite pastime is challenging my clients to swap out ingredients or recipes for a healthy alternative. It's like my pizza. Pizza is like a great example because pizza can be covered in like meat and cheese and who knows what. Very greasy, very heavy, very high calorie, high fat. And so I love challenging people to find an alternative that they like, whether it's a cauliflower crust or just a cleaner version so that you can still indulge but not go totally overboard. (laughs) Yeah. And I feel like this sounds like a fun process as well, you know, finding different alternatives. And I feel like you could make this a really enjoyable thing to get into. Yeah. It's definitely fun. Well, (laughs) yeah, no, definitely sounds like it as well. Um, And we've talked about some practices so far, but I'd love to move into our practices and habits debrief section where we focus on more of a specific practice. So is there one that you've got in mind that you would recommend for optimizing our nutrition? You know, I was trying to think of one thing that I do. Um, Honestly, I think it's my my everyday eating method, which is to visualize. So I don't have time to count calories and macros. And honestly, I've done it long enough that I can eyeball it. And it goes pretty hand in hand for everybody that I talk to. And the rule of thumb is, or the method 
is to always make sure that your plate has a palm size serving of protein. And that would be my palm, right? So my boyfriend has a larger palm. He's a guy. Guys typically have larger palms. Like they would want to eat their palm size, but you and I want to eat our palm size. And then you want to have like half a plate of fruits and or vegetables. And that leaves you with what? Maybe a quarter of your plate for starch. And then your thumb would be like the size of the fat. So if you can visualize that and use that as your guide, it makes putting your plate together, no matter if it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, just a little easier. Um, And that just helps me kind of make sure that I'm hitting all those marks and I'm not going under or over in any one area. Yeah. And do you find any challenges that come along with doing this or sticking to this? So, I mean... No, I think it's the opposite. I think that it helps people who do have challenges with tracking and like people get really bogged down with having to like scan things in their app or clock every single thing. And so for me, I think it's a great tool for people. And I always encourage it in the beginning when I first meet somebody so that I, A, I can understand without a doubt what they're getting in, what they're missing. But also it's a great teaching tool. Like long before I ever went to school, I started educating myself by using my fitness pal. I don't know if you guys have that, but it's a very popular meal tracking app. And so that was the start of it all. And like that simple practice taught me so much about what is a calorie, a protein, a carbon, a fat. But now this method that I'm referring to is probably the more intuitive practice. I only see pros with this, honestly. Yeah, for sure. And I feel like it does sound like very intuitive and something that's visual is something that you can kind of do without having to put in a lot of effort or grab a bunch of resources in order to do it's kind of something you can see in front of you, I guess. Yeah. And I think there's less pressure when you're like not counting every single calorie and macronutrient and it just lets you be a lot more flexible. Like I can dine out, I can look at a menu and gauge, or I can go to a friend's house or a party and I can visually gauge what I need. Yeah. And in terms of like calorie counting, because I know there's a massive like calorie counting culture out there and you go to like the grocery store and you look at the back of the box and oh, it's like 100 calories over what you want to be eating. Do you believe in calorie counting and does that help us be productive while we're eating? I think it's an an important like baseline and understanding what you need to be eating as far as like calories in calories out and I look at it comparable to like a bank account and a budget like we all get paid we all have an income coming in but then we have to make sure that we allocate those funds to pay our rent or our mortgage our light bill our food bill and like all these different things and if you overspend in one category you're not going to have enough in the other category um so my my thought with, you know, simply going by calories is that can be dangerous because people could have nothing but carbohydrates or fats or, you know, and miss an entire category of like protein, which plays a big role in a lot of cellular functions. So um, I don't get too caught up in just calories, but I think it's important to understand the balance of the macros as well. Yeah, for sure. And would you mind explaining the difference between calories and macros? Yes. So the calories are like the overall energy, right? So the calories are like your overall budget. I have $1,200 a month to spend. Or in the case of calories, I have 1,200 calories a day to spend. How am I going to spend that? Well, I'm going to divide it between what we call macronutrients. We have macronutrients, which are your protein, carbs, and fat. And we have micronutrients, which are going to be like your vitamins. Um, in the context of your macronutrients, you have protein, carbs, and fat. And so, for example, when it comes to the budget, I said we had 1200 calories in a day. Proteins and carbs are, um, four calories per gram, whereas a fat is nine calories per gram. So more than double. And I think that's super important to understand when it comes to calories, because you get a lot more bang for your buck, so to speak, with like the protein and the carbs, right? Compared to a fat, like that fat, you're going to spend and blow through it really quick because it's more calorically dense. Yeah, for sure. And why do you, I think that we are so much more attracted to these really cal- like calorie heavy and fat heavy foods as opposed to more healthier options that we know are better for us, but like we just tend to not want to eat them? Oh, it's because they're more palatable. They have way more sodium. They have way more carbohydrates. They have way more fat in them, way more sugar. Um, Unfortunately, that's what makes them taste so good. And that's what keeps people coming back for more. 
Yeah. And do you think that healthier options can be just as palatable as, you know, the obviously more natural ones? 100%. I think, unfortunately, when people go healthy, they forget how to cook and season things. And I am all about flavor. My mom makes fun of me, actually, because I season my food so much. Like there's <laughs> garlic on everything. I think my favorite seasoning is blackened seasoning because it just gives you a little kick of flavor. And I it'll make me eat chicken all day, every day. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have to think about the different ways that you're cooking these foods. Like chicken can be diced, chopped. It can be a breast. It can be a tenderloin with skin, without skin. You can throw it in the oven. You can throw it on the stove. You can throw it on the grill. You can throw it in the crock pot. So we have to remember how versatile we can be with these foods when we're cooking them and seasoning them. Yeah, perfect. Well, my last question in this section for you is, how do you think this practice sort of impacts your own overall productivity and perception in life? So I focus on eating well because I have medical conditions that require me to do so. And if I'm trying to increase my quality of life, and maintain health for the longevity into aging, I want to make sure that I'm functioning the best I can. And I know that I function and I feel better when I'm following this method and I'm not dining out and overeating fast food, things like that. And especially from a celiac disease, which is a, affects your gut, gut health is so important. I really feel like a lot of health conditions, cardiac or brain or otherwise, start with the gut health. If Again, if you're not breaking down and absorbing foods or even picking the right foods, it's a very much a downstream effect. So um, I very much thrive in this area. And I always, it's always such a turning point with my patients when you see them make that connection too. Because in the beginning, they may not know what it's like to feel good. But man, when they start to feel good and they use that to feel them and stay on plan and have less off plan moments, it's beautiful. Consistency is key. Yeah, for sure. And I feel like it's it comes down to, you know, putting in the effort and putting in that time to make those plans and stuff, which might feel a bit unnatural, but I'm guessing you get to a point where you don't need to refer to your plans and all that stuff, or it might be more intuitive to know what to do. So it won't feel like as much effort to be like, okay, I've got to do this, this and this to, you know, eat better. Yeah, you have to make it a habit. And I think Small changes over a period of time have a very large compounding effect on our overall health. Yeah, for sure. Perfect. Well, thank you for sharing some practices with us that we can use. Um, I've got our uh, questions from the audience now. So we've got a few here for you. And my first one here is, how do we maintain a healthy relationship with technology to keep our minds nourished for productivity? So I love this because I immediately think of sleep and how so many people will lay in bed with their phones or their tablet or they have a TV in their room. And that blue light is really detrimental for sleep. And the worse sleep you get, as I mentioned, you're going to have more issues with cognitive function. Um, so my recommendation would be to reduce your blue light exposure. So in my household, around dinner time, I'm turning off all the overhead lights, which tend to be very bright white. And I've purchased yellow lamps with like yellow light bulbs to kind of set the mood and set the tone in the evening. Um, I'm doing like essential oils and lavender. We play nighttime chill music, not whatever's bumping on the radio, right? <laughs> yeah. And like nowadays, like my MacBook will automatically dim and turn the screen yellow so that you're not getting that blue light interference. Um, same with iPhones. I know they do that too, but you can also purchase blue light blocking glasses. Um, and then they also recommend cutting off TV and screen time, you know, an hour to two or three before you lay down so that you can just kind of get your mind to turn off. And actually, it's just creating a routine. Your body gets used to it and your brain gets used to it and it needs to unwind and detach from those modalities. 
Yeah. And what are some of, you know, the physical benefits of, for example, you know, putting your screens away an hour before bed? So first is the improved sleep. So stay, so a lot of times people will complain of difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. And so that'll be my first go-to is just addressing your sleep hygiene is what we call it. Um, so much like we can control what goes into our body, we can control these habits around bedtime. And so um, we see improvements in the ability to fall asleep faster, but also stay asleep longer. And then other cues we look for are waking up refreshed and making sure that you don't have any energy crashes mid-morning or mid-afternoon so that we can, again, have better brain function throughout the entire day. Perfect. And my next question for you is, how can we optimize our workspaces or living spaces to create a nourishing environment for our mind? Oh, I feel like that's so individual because, you know, it's visually aesthetic for me may not be aesthetic for somebody else. Um, I will say recently I was reading about red light at bedtime, particularly for children and how it's beneficial in helping them unwind. It's like I had mentioned using lamps and turning off white light for sure. You don't want bright white light, but there are benefits to using, you know, yellow lights because it's not as bright, but also blue and red are beneficial colors that help people relax, calm down, unwind, and fall asleep. So I would focus on that. Um, Also, sleeping in a cool, dark room helps a lot with sleep in particular. And I'm using sleep as like the main force in promoting, you know, cognitive effects. But again, sleep is so crucial and so many people miss this area. So make sure you're dropping that temperature down. Make sure you have blackout curtains. Make sure you're cognizant of what kind of lights. Again, this is where a TV would be detrimental in the bedroom. Yeah, for sure. And what about, you know, our generation right now who are so like hooked on their phones and it's like the last thing they do before going to bed. Do you have something you would recommend in place of that to fill in that half an hour or one hour before bed? Yeah read a book. <laughs> I think I <laughs> forgot about books. Um, put the phone away. And what's really cool about Apple products, um, I'm biased because they have Apple. They have me suckered in. <laughs> um, but they can set timers, right? So you can set timers for your apps, like as far as like how long you're spending on the day, but you can also cut it off at a certain time in the evening so that you're not tempted by that distraction and the app notifications on your phone. I definitely recommend that you can definitely put like a sleep mode on there and it'll set a timer, dim the lights, all this stuff. Um, Reading a book, taking a shower. I think self-care at bedtime is the perfect time to unwind and make sure that you're kind of resetting yourself physically and mentally and downregulating yourself for sleep. Um, Other people do really well with a workout. Me, not so much. But I remember in my 20s, there was nothing better than getting off and going to the gym at like 8 o'clock at night. And then I would crash and go to bed. So for some people, that works. Yeah, for sure. And I guess it's all about finding what works for you. And like you said before, like things are very individualistic. So what works for you and me might not work for someone else. So it's very important to remember. Yeah, I think yoga is probably my preferred. Yoga has actually been really well studied to downregulate your central nervous system, which is like that fight or flight um, system. And so yoga is really good, like the deep relaxing, deep breathing yoga, not hot yoga. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And then also things like deep breathing exercises. So one that comes to mind is like the four, seven, eight breathing technique where you breathe in for four, hold for seven, out for eight. This is a very long drawn out and you can repeat that up to four times and that too. I recommend people do it before eating. I recommend them do it in like acute moments of stress. I recommend it before bed and it really does help kind of calm down your brain and that central nervous system. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I've got one last question for you. And that is, what are some quick and easy snacks that busy professionals can grab on the go to give their brains that extra boost? Oh, I love this one. We actually just did a post about this on my social media with little cute mason jars on the go. And you just like save, you can either buy them or you can save like your kids applesauce jars because they're the perfect size and they fit right inside a mason jar. Um, But everything from like 
veggie sticks, not veggie sticks. I'm thinking like carrots and things like that. So vegetables with like a hummus. Um, so a hummus is technically a legume, but they mix it with like an oil and it can be very anti-inflammatory. Um, or maybe you do like an olive oil. Olive oil is, a, again, an, an omega-3. That would be a really good dipper. Um, fruit also. So thinking of like berries or other fruits and like a yogurt, like a Greek yogurt would be high in protein. Um, just make sure it's unflavored, right? We don't want like the additional sugars and stuff in there. There's plenty of natural sugars in our berries. Um, or maybe doing like a pretzel or something and like a hummus dip, you know, that would be a good snack too. Protein shakes are also a favorite. Um, some are better than others, but I think, you know, making your own if you can, or whether it's just like a scoop of protein powder and milk or almond milk or whatever in a shaker cup. Or make it something more robust, like throw it into a smoothie with like your protein, a handful of fruit, a handful of spinach, some flax oil or almond butter. I see I just did it. The protein, half a plate of uh, fruit and vegetables, and then your fat. And you have a whole meal on the go. Yeah, perfect. Well, I feel like there's so many fun little ways to find different snacks that you can have on the go. Um, and how would you recommend people find some different snacks? Like they've had some for like a while now, they're getting a bit bored of them. How can they, you know, change it up a bit? So there's all kinds of like meal planner tools. We offer a meal planner that will give you snack ideas. It breaks down recipes by breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then you can look for snacks and stuff. Um I also like to peruse the aisles myself and I just like to, especially like a Whole Foods or a Sprouts over a regular grocery store, but they often have like the packages are marketed towards to like health promoting foods. You have to be careful and like do your research, of course, but I think there's no, nothing more fun. Like for me, it's drinks. I love finding carbonated fun drinks besides alcohol, right? Because alcohol would be detrimental for brain health. So I'm always looking for like these drinks that are tasty and sparkling and fun and not like a wine or something, but they actually have like adaptogens from like mushrooms and things, which are really good for your brain. So I, I love experimenting with those. Um, the only downside to them is that sometimes they have a couple grams of sugar, but you know, that compared to wine or a full Coke, it's not a big deal. Um, but also a lot of grocery stores have like little snack areas and like the fresh section with fruits and vegetables. So sometimes you just got to go and peruse the aisles and just find something that looks appealing and try it or get a couple things and see what you like. Yeah, beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing that with us as well. And I find that's always really fun just to like go through the aisles and find different things. I feel like when we go to grocery stores, we often go in with this mindset of like, I know exactly what I'm going to get. And I kind of just have like tunnel vision and I'm not really looking at all these different options that are there. So that's like a really great strategy. Yeah, it can be overwhelming sometimes in the grocery store, but there's so many options. Yeah, for sure. Beautiful. Well, that brings us now to our last section for today, which is our open mic. So I'm just going to hand it over to you to talk to us about anything that you would like to. Uh, but yeah, the floor is all yours. Okay. Um, so I guess if I was just openly talk about nutrition, um. I would say don't get overwhelmed or caught up in the idea that you have to be perfect. I think we all have to give ourselves grace and understand that one, this is a lifestyle change. So I think if, as long as you're doing something every day to kind of make small changes for the better, whether it's just taking a multivitamin, like for some people, we just start there, like just take a multivitamin to fill in the gaps, like you'll be fine. For other people, it's maybe we just add in protein. Maybe I review somebody's diet and I'm like, hey, before we focus on removing a whole bunch of stuff and completely overhauling this person's lifestyle, maybe we just start with get enough protein. Hey, let's start with that one tiny goal or fiber or something. Um, so just remember it's small changes over a while that are going to lead up to something more sustainable for the long term. Um, and just, uh, you know, remember that supplements are not always our go-to method. I think food first and foremost, and then addressing any underlying root 
causes. So weight loss is a perfect example because so many people will come in and ask me why they're not losing weight despite doing X, Y, and Z. And it's not until we take a step back and we look at the bigger picture and we address gut health, hormone imbalances, or stress, or sleep, and that it fully starts to kind of come together. And so I think working with a nutrition professional is a great idea, even if it's just temporary. Like my goal is never to have somebody come and work with me and be stuck with me forever and ever and feel like they can't operate without me. Like, no, my goal is that you come in and you have an appointment with me and that you learn something new every single time that you can take away and apply to yourself. And sure, maybe you're seeing me more frequently in the beginning every two to four weeks. But if you're doing what you need to be doing and learning all these things and implementing them, eventually we're spreading that out a month, three months, six months, so on. So that, you know, you're only coming in for like little checkups, accountability checkups, basically. Yeah, for sure. And for I know you mentioned this idea of weight loss before. So should people focus on, you know, healthy eating with weight loss in mind? Or is that just something totally separate? Because I know sometimes when people think of diets or eating healthier, they immediately think, oh, this is the perfect way to lose weight. That's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. Because actually, a lot of times I'll have people come in and when I And they're like, hey, I've been doing this, that, and the other thing, and I'm not losing weight. Like, what do you think? What can you do to help me? I always tell them, you know, if we're doing things right, weight loss should be a happy side effect. That being like, if I'm working somebody through like a gut protocol or a hormone protocol, weight loss would be a sign that it's working along with, you know, all the other signs and symptoms that come along with that. Yeah. And do you think you can eat healthy and still maintain your weight or is choosing to eat healthy immediately going to correlate with weight loss? No, I think eating healthy, healthy is such a different definition for everybody, right? So between my two kids, for example, they were arguing over what was a healthier milk because my son drinks dairy cow milk and my daughter cannot. She's lactose intolerant. She drinks almond milk. And they got into this heated debate about which one was healthier. And I was like, guys, you can't say what's healthier in general because what's healthy for you is not healthy for her and vice versa, right? Um, So when it comes to diets, it's the same way. Some people need higher protein. Some people need lower protein. Some people have to avoid entire food categories. Gluten, for one, being celiac. I can't have any gluten or wheat. So my version of healthy is going to be very different than somebody else's. But I think if you're eating enough, you know, with the fun part about eating a more whole foods diet is a lot of times I can take somebody from eating an 1800 calorie Western diet full of highly refined processed carbohydrates, maybe a little bit short on protein and fiber, lacking fruits and vegetables, right? And I put them on a whole foods balanced diet with adequate protein, balanced carbs and fat, they can actually get more volume from that amount of plate. You ever seen those comparisons, like those memes where it's like, this is 600 calories of this food compared to 600 calories of this food. And Mm. it's like the whole food takes up the whole thing, right? Whereas like a small condensed burger is going to have so many more calories. So no, eating healthy does not correlate with weight loss. I think it's totally... Um, doable to put on weight or even manage weight, eating healthy for you, whatever that looks like. Yeah, for sure. And I guess like you've been mentioning throughout the whole episode today, it's all about the individual and it changes for each person. So that's also pretty crucial to remember, I guess. Yes. Awesome. Well, that also brings us to the end of today's episode. So just wanted to say thank you so much, Tara, for coming on with us. And it was a pleasure talking to you about our topic today. Thank you so much for bringing me on and having this opportunity. I enjoy any chance I can ramble on about nutrition. And (laughs) let me know if you guys have any questions. I'm happy to answer. Perfect. And if someone did want to check out some more of your work or find you online, where can they go? So our website is skytherapeutic.com. You can also email me info at skytherapeutic.com. I'm on um, Instagram and TikTok, (laughs) Territories (laughs) Nutrition, or my business page is Sky Therapeutics. Feel free to send us a message. 
We do complimentary discovery um, calls. So if you're interested in a nutrition consult, we're happy to jump on a completely complimentary call and answer your questions and see if it would be a good fit because we understand that this is a very individualized journey and we want to make sure that our personalities match and, you know, um, just that we align in, in all of those areas. So please feel free to reach out. We're happy to, to talk to you. Beautiful. Well, we've also got Tara's information down in the description below. But to everyone listening, thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time. You have been listening to Work in Progress, the personal productivity science insights podcast produced by the Life Management Science Labs. Listen to episodes from LMSL's 10 Life Management Perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or other podcasting apps on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it and us grow to bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, pp.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Joanna. Thanks for tuning in.